Chapter 7 of Operation Terror by Murray Leinster. Read by Mark Nelson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Operation Terror, Chapter 7. The driver was avidly curious about the area where supposedly no human being could survive. He asked absorbed questions, especially and insistently about aliens. Jill said that she'd seen a few of them, but only at a distance. They'd been investigating the evacuated construction camp. They were about the size of men. She couldn't describe them, but they weren't human beings. He seemed to find it unthinkable that she hadn't examined them in detail. Lockley came to her rescue. He observed that he'd been a prisoner of the invaders and had escaped. Then the driver's curiosity became insatiable. He wanted to know every imaginable detail of that experience. He expressed almost incredulous disappointment that Lockley couldn't give even a partial description of the creatures. When convinced, he launched a detailed recital of the descriptions offered by the workmen from the camp. He pictured the aliens as hoofed like horses, equipped with horns like antelopes, fitted with multiple arms like octopi, and huge, multifaceted eyes like insects. He seemed to contemplate this picture with vast satisfaction as the truck growled and grumbled through the night. The headlights glared on ahead of the truck. There were dark fields and darker mountains beyond them. From time to time little side roads branched off. They undoubtedly led to houses, but no speck of lamplight appeared anywhere. This part of the world was empty, with the loneliness of a landscape from which every hint of human activity had been removed. Jill asked a question. The driver grew garrulous. He gave a dramatic picture of terror throughout the world, the suspension of all ordinary antagonisms in the face of this menace to every man and nation on the earth. There was peace even in the world's trouble spots as appalled agitators saw how much worse things could be if the monsters took over the world to rule. But the driver insisted that the United States was calm. Us Americans, he assured Lockley, weren't scared. We were educated, and we knew that them scientists would crack this nut somehow. Like only yesterday, a broadcast said this Belgian guy had come up with calculations that said this poison beam had to be something like a radar beam, or a laser beam, or something like that. And the American scientists were right out there in front, along with guys from England and France and Italy and Germany and even Russia. All the big brains of the world were working on it. Those Martians were gonna wish they'd come visit in polite, instead of barging in like they owned the world. They'd be lucky if they wound up owning Mars. Lockley pressed for details about the scientist's results. He didn't expect to get them, but the driver cheerfully obliged. Radio, said the driver largely, worked by making waves like those on a pond. They spread out and reached places where there were instruments to detect them, and that was that. Radar made the same kind of waves, only smaller, which bounced back to where there was an instrument to detect them. These were ripple waves. Lockley interpreted the term to mean sine waves, rounded at top and trough. It was a perfectly good word to express the meaning intended. These were natural kinds of waves, pursued the driver. Lightning made them, static was them, and sparks from running motors and blown fuses. Waves like that were generated whenever an electric circuit was made or broken, besides their occurrence from purely natural causes. We can't feel em, said the driver expansively. We're used to waves like that. Animals couldn't do anything about em and didn't need to before there was men. So when we come along, we couldn't notice em any more than we notice air pressure on our skin. We're used to it. But these scientists say there's waves that ain't natural. They ain't like ripples. They're like storm waves with foam on em. And that's the kind of waves we can notice like storm waves with sharp edges. We can notice them because they do things to us. These Martians make them do things. But now we know what kind of waves they are, we're gonna mess them up. 
and I'm saving up a special kick for one of those Martians when they're licked, just as soon as I can find out which end of him is which and suited to that kind of attention." Lockley found himself suspicious and was annoyed. Jill was safe now. The driver was well informed, but probably everybody was well informed now. They had reason to become so. The truck trundled through the night. High overhead, a squadron of planes arrived to take its place in the ever-moving patrol around the park. Another squadron, relieved, went away to the southwest. There was a deep-toned, far-away roaring from the engines aloft. All the sky behind the trailer seemed to mutter continuously, but the roof of the stars ahead was silent. Lockley stayed tense and was weary of his tenseness. Jill was safe. He tried to reason his uneasiness away. The cab of the truck wobbled and swayed. The feel of the vehicle was entirely unlike the feel of a passenger car. It felt tail-heavy. The driver had ceased to talk. He seemed to be musing as he drove. He asked about the invaders, but seemed almost indifferent to any adventures Jill and Lockley might have had on their way out. He didn't ask what they'd done for food. He was thinking of something else. Lockley found himself questioning the driver's statements just after they got in. Driving for the Army. The Army kept track of where the terror beams existed and notified this truck by truck radio, and he dodged all such road barriers. That was what he said. It seemed plausible, but— One thing strikes me funny, said the driver, musingly. Those critters blindfolding you and those other guys. What do you think they did it for? To keep us from seeing them, said Lockley, curtly. But why'd they want to do that? Because, said Lockley, they might not have been Martians. They might not have been critters. They might have been men. Because, said Lockley, they might not have been Martians. They might not have been critters. They might have been men. On the instant, he regretted bitterly that he'd said it. It was a guess only, with all the evidence against it. The driver visibly jumped. Then he turned his head. "'Where'd you get that idea?' he demanded. "'What's the evidence? Why do you think it?' "'They blindfolded me,' said Lockley, briefly. A pause. Then the driver said, vexedly, that's a funny thing to make you think they was men. Hell, excuse me, ma'am, they could have had all kinds of reasons for blindfolding you. It could have been part of their religion. Maybe, said Lockley. He was angry with himself for having said something which was needlessly dramatic. Didn't you have any other reason for thinking they were men? demanded the driver, curiously. No other reason at all? No other at all, said Lockley. It's a crazy reason, if you ask me. Quite likely, conceded Lockley. He'd been indiscreet, but no more. He'd said what he thought, perhaps because he was tired of watching all the country round him for a menace to Jill, and then watching every word he spoke to keep her from abandoning hope for Vale. Jill said, Where are we headed for? I hope I can get to a telephone. I want to ask about somebody. He wants to tell the soldiers something. "'We're headed for Army Supply Dump,' said the driver comfortably, "'to load up with some stuff for the guys that are watching all around the park. We'll be going through Serena presently.' "'Funny. Everybody moved out by the Army. A good thing, too. The folks in Maplewood could have been got out last night before the Martians got there.' The trailer truck went on through the night. The driver lounged in his seat, keeping a negligent but capable eye on the road ahead. The headlight showed a place where another road crossed this one, and there was a filling station, still and dark, and four or five dwellings nearby with no single sign of life about them. Then the crossroad settlement fell behind. A mile beyond it, Jill said startledly, "'Lights! There's a town! It's lighted!' It's Serena, said the driver. The street lights are on because the electricity comes from far away. 
With the lights on, it's a marker for the planes, too, so they can tell exactly where they are, and the park, too. They can't see the ground so good at night, from away up there." The white street lamp seemed to twinkle as the trailer truck rumbled on. A single long line of them appeared to welcome the big vehicle. It went on into the town. It reached the business district. There were side streets, utterly empty, and then the main street divided. The truck bore to the right. There were three- and four-story buildings. Every window was blank and empty, reflecting only the white street lamps. No living thing anywhere. There had been no destruction, but the town was dead. Its light shone on streets so empty that it would have seemed better to leave them to the kindly dark. Jill exclaimed, "'Look, that window!' and ahead, in the dead and lifeless town, a single window glowed from electric light inside it, and it looked lonelier than anything else in the world. "'I'm going to look into that,' said the driver. "'Nobody's supposed to be here.' The truck came to a stop. The driver got out. There was a stirring behind, and the small man who'd given his place to Jill and Lockley popped out of the trailer body. Lockley saw the name of a local telephone company silhouetted on the lighted window pane. He opened the door. Jill followed him instantly. The four of them, driver, helper, Lockley, and Jill, crowded into the building hallway to investigate the one lighted room in a town where twenty thousand people were supposed to live. There was a door with a frosted glass top through which light showed. The driver turned the doorknob and marched in. The room had an alcoholic smell. A man with sunken cheeks slept heavily in a chair, his head forward on his chest. The driver shook him. "'Wake up, guy,' he said sternly. "'Orders are for all civilians to clear out of this town. You want a soldier to come by and take you for a looter and bump you off?' He shook again. The cadaverous man blinked his eyes open. The smell of alcohol was distinct. He was drunk. He gazed ferociously up at the driver of the truck. "'Who the hell are you?' he demanded belligerently. The driver spoke sternly, repeating what he'd said before. The driver assumed an air of outraged dignity. "'If I want to stay here, that's my business. Who the hell are you anyways, disturbing a citizen taxpayer on his lawful occasions? Are you Martians? I wouldn't put it past you.' He sat down and went back to sleep. The driver said, fretfully, "'He oughtn't to be here. We ain't got room to carry him. I'm going to use the truck radio and ask what to do. Maybe they'll send an the army truck to get him out of here. He could set the whole town on fire.' He went out. The small man who was his helper followed him. He hadn't spoken a word. Lockley growled. Then Jill said breathlessly, the switchboard is some long-distance lines. I know how to connect them. Shall I try?" Lockley agreed emphatically. Jill slipped into the operator's chair and donned the headset. She inserted a plug and pressed a switch. I did an article once on how— Hello! Serena calling. I have a very important message for the military officer in command of the cordon. Will you route me through, please? Her manner was convincingly professional. She looked up and smiled shakily at Lockley. She spoke again into the mouthpiece before her. Then she said, "'One moment, please.' She covered the mouthpiece with her hand. "'I can't get the general,' she said. "'His aide will take the message, and if it's important enough—' "'It is,' said Lockley. "'Give me the phone.' She vacated the chair and handed him the operator's instrument with its lightweight earphones and a mouthpiece that rested on his chest. My name's Lockley, said Lockley evenly. I was in the park on a survey job the morning the thing came down from the sky. I relayed Vale's message describing the landing and the creatures that came out of the object. I was talking to him by the microwave when he was seized by them. I reported that via Sattel of the survey. You probably know of these reports. A tinny voice said with formal cordiality that he did indeed. I've just managed to get out of the park, said Lockley. I've had a chance to experiment with a stationary terror beam. 
I have information of some importance about detecting those beams before they strike." The tinny voice said hastily that Lockley should speak to the general himself. There were clickings and a long wait. Lockley shook his head impatiently. When a new voice spoke, he said, "'I'm at Serena. I was brought here by a wildlife control trailer truck which picked us up just outside the park. I mention that because the driver says he's driving it for the Army now. The information I have to pass on is—' Curtly and succinctly he began to give exact information about the terror beam. Its detection so that one need not enter it. The total lack of effectiveness of a Faraday cage to check it. Its use to block highways and its one use against a low-flying plane. The failure to search him out with that terror beam was to be noted. There was other evidence that the monsters were not monsters at all. The new voice interrupted sharply. It asked him to wait. His information would be recorded. Lockley waited, biting his lips. The voice returned after an unconscionably long wait. It told him to go ahead. The driver of the truck was taking a long time to make contact with the military. He'd have done better by telephone instead of shortwave. The new voice repeated sharply for Lockley to go on with his story. And very, very carefully Lockley explained the contradictions in the behavior of the invaders. The blindfolds. The fact that it had been absurdly easy for four human prisoners in a compost pit shell to escape almost as if it were intended for them to get away and report that their captors regarded men as on a par with game birds and rabbits and porcupines. True aliens would not have bothered to give such an impression, but men cooperating with aliens would contrive every possible trick to insist that only aliens operated at Boulder Lake. I'm saying, said Lockley carefully, that they do not act like aliens making a first landing on Earth. Apparently their ship is designed to land in deep water. On a first landing they should have chosen the sea. But they knew Boulder Lake was deep enough to cushion their descent. How did they know it? They didn't kill us local animals for study, but they dropped in other local animals to convince us that they wouldn't mind. Why try to fill us with horror and then let us escape? The voice at the other end said sharply, What do you infer from all this? They've been briefed, said Lockley. They know too much about this planet and us humans. Somebody has told them about human psychology, and suggested that they conquer us without destroying our cities, or our factories, or our usefulness as slaves. We'll be much more valuable if captured that way. I'm saying that they've got humans advising and cooperating with them. I'm suggesting that those humans have made a deal to run Earth for the aliens, paying them all the tribute they can demand. I'm saying that we're not up against an invasion only by aliens, but by aliens with humans in active cooperation, and acting not only as advisors, but probably as spies. I'm— Mr. Lockley, said the voice at the other end of the wire. It was startled and shocked. It became pompous. "'Mr. Lockley, what has been your training?' The voice did not wait for an answer. "'Where have you become qualified to offer opinions contradicting all the information and all the decisions of scientists and military men alike? Where do you get the authority to make such statements? They are preposterous. You have wasted my time. You—' Lockley reached over and flipped back the switch he'd seen Jill flip over. He carefully put down the headset. He stood up. The driver and the small man came back. They picked up the sleeping drunk and moved toward the door. Something fell out of the drunk's pocket. It was a wallet. They did not notice. They went out, carrying the drunk. Jill stooped and recovered it. She looked at Lockley's face. What? I'm trying, said Lockley in a grating voice, to figure out what to do next. That didn't work. I'll be right back, said Jill. She went out to deliver the wallet to the driver, who had apparently been ordered to put the drunk in the trailer body and deliver him somewhere. 
Lockley swore explosively when she was gone. He clenched and unclenched his hands. He paced the length of the room. Jill came back, her face white. "'They opened the door of the trailer to pass him in,' she said in a thin, strained voice. "'And there were other men back there, several of them, and machinery. Not cages for animals, but engines, generators, electrical things. I'm frightened.' "'And I,' said Lockley, "'am a fool. I should have known it. Look here!' The frosted glass door opened. The driver came back. He had a revolver in his hand. "'Too bad,' he said calmly. "'We should have been more careful. But the lady saw too much. Now—' The revolver bore on Lockley. Jill flung herself upon it. Lockley swung with every ounce of his strength. He connected with the driver's jaw. The driver went limp. Lockley had the revolver almost before he reached the floor. "'Quick!' he snapped. "'Where was the machinery? Front or back part of the trailer?' "'All of it,' panted Jill. "'Mostly front. What—' "'The hall again,' Lockley snapped. "'Hunt for a back door.' He thrust her out. She fumbled toward the back of the building while he went to the street entrance. The trailer truck loomed huge. The driver's helper came out of it. Another man followed him still another. Lockley fired from the doorway, one bullet through the front part of the truck, one near the middle, then a third halfway between the first two. The three men dived to the ground, thinking themselves his targets. But Jill called inarticulately from the back of the dark hall. Lockley raced back to her. He saw a starlight. She waited, shivering. They went out, and he closed the door softly behind him. He took her hand, and they ran through the night. Overhead there was a luminous mistiness because of the street light, but here were abysmal darknesses between vague areas on which the starlight fell. Lockley said evenly, "'We've got to be quiet. Maybe I hit some of the machinery. Maybe. If I didn't, it's all over.' The back of a building, an alleyway, they ran down it. There was a street with trees where the street lights cast utterly black shadows in between intolerable glare. They ran across the street. On the other side were residences. The business district was not large. Lockley found a gate and opened it quietly, and as quietly closed it behind them. They ran into a lane between two dead, dark, dreary structures, in which people had lived, but from which all life was now gone. A backyard. A fence. Lockley helped Jill get over it. Another lane, another street. But this street was not crossed, not here anyhow, by another which led back to the street of the telephone office. A man could not look from there and see them running under the lights. The blessed irregularity of the streets continued. They ran and ran until Jill's breath came in pantings. Lockley was drenched in sweat because he expected at any instant to smell the most loathsome of all possible combinations of odors, and then to see flashing lights originating in his own eyes, and sounds which would exist only in the nerves of his ears, and then to feel all his muscles knot in total and horrible paralysis. They heard the truck motor rumble into life when they were many blocks away. They heard the clumsy vehicle move. It continued to growl, and they knew that it was moving about the streets, with its occupants trying to sight fleeing figures under the darknesses which were trees. "'I hit! I hit the generator!' panted Lockley. "'I must have! Else they'd swing a beam on us!' He stopped. Here they were in a district where many large homes pooled their lawns in block-long stretches of soft green. The street lights cast arbitrary patches of brightness against the houses, but their windows were blank and dark. This street, like most in this small town, was lined with trees on either side. There were the fragrances of flowers and grass. "'We aren't safe now,' said Lockley. "'But I just found out there may not be any safety anywhere.' Jill's teeth chattered. "'What will we do? What was that machinery?' I felt, 
Frightened, because it wasn't what he said was back there. So I told you. But what was it?" At a guess, said Lockley, a terror beam generator. The invaders must have human friends. To us, they're spies. They're cooperating with the monsters. Apparently, they're even trusted with terror beam projectors. He stood still, thinking, while in the distance the trailer truck ground and rumbled about the streets. It was not a very promising method for finding two fugitives. They could hide if it turned onto a street they used. It could not continue the search indefinitely. The most likely final course would be to leave some of the unknown number of men in its trailer to search the town on foot. Even that might not be successful. It wouldn't be a good idea for Lockley and Jill to remain here, either. "'We look for two-car garages,' said Lockley. "'It's not a good chance, but it's all we've got. If somebody had two cars, they might have left one behind when they evacuated. I can jump an ignition switch if necessary. Meanwhile, we'll be moving out of town, which is a good idea, even if we do it on foot.' They ceased to use the streets, with their dramatic contrast of vivid lights with total shadows. They moved behind a row of what would be considered mansions in Serena, Colorado. Sometimes they stumbled over flower beds, and once there was a hose over which Jill tripped, and once Lockley barked his shin on a garden wheelbarrow. Most of the garages were empty, or contained only tools and garden equipment. Then something made Lockley look up. A slender, truss-braced, mass-like tower rose skyward. It began on the lawn of a house with wide porches. There was a two-car garage with one wide door open. A radio ham, said Lockley. I wonder. But he looked first in the garage. There was a car. It looked all right. He climbed in and opened the door. The dome light came on. The key was still in the ignition. He turned it, and the gauge showed that the gas tank was three-quarters full. This was unbelievably good fortune. "'They probably intended to use this and then change their minds,' said Lockley. "'I'll get the door open and attempt a little burglary. Just one burglary, with a prayer that he used a storage battery for his power.' Breaking in was simple. He tried the windows opening on the main wide porch. One window slid up. He went inside, Jill following. The ham radio outfit was in the cellar. Like most radio hams, this one had battery-powered equipment as a matter of public responsibility. In case of storm or disaster when power lines are down, the ham operators of the United States can function as emergency communication systems, working without outside power. This operator was equipped as membership in the organization required. Lockley warmed up the tubes. He tuned to a general call frequency. He began to say, May Day, May Day, May Day, in a level voice. This emergency call has precedence over all other calls but SOS, which has an identical meaning but May Day is more distinct and unmistakable when heard faintly. There were answers within minutes. Lockley snapped for them to stay tuned while he called for others. He had half a dozen hams waiting curiously when he began to broadcast what he wanted the world to know. He told it as briefly and as convincingly as he could. Then he said, Over, and threw the reception switch for questions. There were no questions. His broadcast had been jammed. Some other station or stations were transmitting pure static with deafening volume, evidently from somewhere nearby. Lockley could not tell when it had begun. It could have been from the instant he began to speak. It was very likely that not one really useful word had been heard anywhere. But a direction finder could have betrayed his position. End of chapter 7